Okay. Well, after my first number theory web seminar, I swore I would never give another one. Uh, this is it. Uh, sorry, that's only a joke. Uh, that's a Spike Milligan joke. Uh, I'm very pleased to uh, to to give this second one. Uh, the technical preparations were somewhat tedious, but uh, the intellectual preparations were great fun. So uh, there's my title. Uh, some new. Uh, and then you see a misprint, uh, a lit pick, and uh, that's a uh, that's my favourite misprint. Uh, I was getting my PhD ready for submission to the University of Cambridge in 1974, and it was all typed up, and I checked it, 140 pages, all all, all mathematically correct, and the title page then had the word a lit pick, and it was all typed. Uh, so I had to get out a little uh, a little bottle of white liquid and a little brush. And and uh, type out and uh, wipe out the p and the t, and then write them in again, imitating TypeScript. And uh, here is the now. Do you, yes, here is the here is the uh, here is the thesis. And uh, on the title page, you can't see it now, but uh, it's a little bit. Uh, it's uh, I got through. I they uh, I got my PhD. <clears throat> okay. Uh, so uh, it's an odd title, a strange title. Um, um, it's almost like some new positive integers. Uh, how can there be new elliptic integrals? How can there be new, be, be new positive, inter positive integers? But uh, there are. Uh, number two, please, Philip. Here is a new positive integer. Uh, Six six billion four thousand and forty nine, and I first met this number in nineteen seventy nine in uh, at Sydney. Uh, I think I was invited by Van der Porten, uh, and uh, <clears throat> I went into the the library. I was the University of Sydney. I went into the the library and found this book. Find this pick this find by inspection a factor of this number. Six billion and uh, four thousand and forty nine, and I thought, how can anybody find solve this problem? Inspection means you can't even write anything down, and uh, <clears throat> and it contains all kinds of all kinds of things like this. Uh, here, here you have to factorize these huge large numbers. Here you have to factorize as far as possible, but these numbers you have to factorize completely. And the book was written in 1906, so you didn't have any, you had no electronic calculators or computers or anything like that to help you, you only these funny calculating machines. Okay, uh, now number three, please, Philip. That's, yes, 1979, uh, that's also an interesting new number. Uh, that's a prime number. And uh, if you add these six digits here, you get primes uh, for the first uh, few terms. Like this is a prime, I can do color, you see. And then and then, then all these numbers are primes. Uh, Van der Porten showed me that, probably in 1979. And uh, it's, an, it's an exercise to show that, that there's no longer example this is quite useful to, to know this kind of thing if you have something you want to check for large primes you just write this that number down and try only the, the partial sums kind of thing okay number four please yes that's so much for positive integers uh, here we have integrals and, and uh, these arise from the concept of elementary integrability so uh, one over x uh, is integrable, uh, integrates to log x. One over x log x integrates to log log x. But if you try and integrate one over log x, then it's not elementary in any sense, in the sense that I'll soon describe. Uh, it's, ah, oh, I've now got two arrows going over. It has a name. It's essentially the logarithmic integral Lix in prime number theory, but that doesn't qualify for elementary. What is the key property? That is that the integral of fx dx can be written down using x and fx, and then the log function, and the, by symmetry, the exponential function, and you throw in algebraic functions. 
So for example, sheet five, Uh, this could be an answer to the integral x of square root log log x plus log 1 plus x x fx. So you're allowed all kinds of uh, combinations, uh, additions, uh, uh, and uh, iterations, and so on. And uh, uh, you can do a, a formal definition. And the best formal definition, I think, is by differential algebra. I won't give it here, but the differential algebra um, completely sweeps under the carpet all problems of domains of definition or even differentiability and this kind of thing. It doesn't, it, it doesn't even sweep under the carpet. It elimin eliminates them completely. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, I just skip this phrase now. And, uh, and I, another reason I don't give this is that there's a simplification. That was about around 1840, Newville showed that uh, exponential is not really needed in the definition. And even log log and algebraic functions are not needed either. At this point, I would skip back to the previous one, but I, that's too tedious, I think. Uh, in the previous one, we did see a log log, but it wasn't really a log log. It was log of log, and log was given to you in the integrand. So, uh, and the idea of his theorem, which I don't state, uh, Precisely, uh, fx, the integral fx dx is elementary if and only if it is a linear form in logarithms. And what does that mean? Uh, slide six, please. Uh, f0 plus c1 log f1 plus up to cm log fm. Uh, this is the formula labeled Uville. And here, c1 up to cm are constants in c and F0, F1 up to Fn are in this large looking field here that you get by adjoining uh, all the der derivatives of F. And uh, we don't have to say that F is infinitely many different, if infinitely often differentiable. This is implicit in the, in the differential algebra business. So uh, if you know that the integral has to have this special form, there's no exponentials and there's no log logs and the there's no iterations and there's so essentially only additions, then it becomes a relatively easy exercise to check that this uh, dx over log x is not not elementary. And the hint here is that this big this big field that I introduced, uh, I have my arrow here, yeah, this one here uh, is actually uh, rather simple, just generated by x and log x. And uh, x and log x are algebraically independent functions, so you can call y equals log x and then you have, have a problem in a function field of transcendence degree two and that gives you plenty of room to work in. But if you uh, now uh, look at integrals of uh, algebraic functions, square root of x cubed minus x, uh, let me just, uh, let me just get rid of the, oh yeah. Uh, this this integral also has a name. It's two times p to the minus one x, where p is the Weierstrass function corresponding to a certain elliptic curve or g two g three, and uh, it's, uh, the uh, the uh, verbal name is an elliptic logarithm. Then the transcendence degree of this apparently large field is just one, and that means you haven't got so much space, and the thing is uh, not quite so elementary. <clears throat> One has to consider zeros and poles on this elliptic curve uh, defined by y squared equals uh, x cubed minus x and I multiply by four because I will soon be in in, uh, in Weierstrass mode. So this is this is an easy exercise if you know a bit of theory here and then once you've done that it's just a small step to show something a bit more complicated that if you take uh, now, uh, this integral, so dx over y is just the same as this one, more or less, because of the y. And then you put this rash, simple rational function in, x, 1 over x minus tau. Then this being elementary implies that uh, a certain point is torsion on E. Uh, and it's the point with uh, ordinate, with abscissa tau, and then the, the uh, ordinate is to root tau cubed minus tau. 
And uh, this is a key formula as well. It shows how torsion comes into the whole thing. And uh, with torsion comes number theory and so on. Okay. Uh, so six extended footnote, uh, please. Yes. Yeah, so that's a proof of this implication. I think I'll skip this on, on grounds of time. Uh, <clears throat> It, it's there's not much to it a bit of elliptic th oh yeah there's a bit of elliptic theory but uh uh i call it whitaker watson section 2013 and 2014 these are the old this this is what i first learned elliptic functions from good old good old uh ah where am i oh i i uh, no, I've, yeah here is here is whitaker and watson almost falling apart at the seams uh then uh do that again <clears throat> and then uh there's not much to it if you know a little bit about elliptic curves uh, unfortunately you can't re reverse the the argument and uh, that's the whole uh, that's the whole problem in what I'm going to talk about okay so now uh, pay, uh, <clears throat> page 7 please so in fact, I say that the the opposite implication is false. A great pity, as we shall see. So we finally arrived at elliptic in the title. Uh, the difficulties here can be illustrated by the fact, probably known to Arbel and Chebyshev, that if you take now dx over y and uh, put this rational function in, uh, before we put 1 over x minus tau, now I put this explicit rational function in then this is actually elementary becomes elementary again even though without this thing it's not elementary and that has m equals one in Liouville. uh so in Liouville, you had the logarithms and m was the number of logarithms so that's elementary uh with a single logarithm but if you uh it's no easy feat to work it out if you give this to maple it's completely baffled uh, there's a nice note of van der Poort and, and Tran in the year 2000, and that gives many more examples. My favorite example uh, is Euler's in 1780, and now you put this rational function in, much more complicated. Uh, this was in disguise. I've transformed Arbel and Chebyshev were working with square roots of quartic polynomials and, and Pell's equation, but I don't want to introduce that here. Uh, and so I had to transform it and I transformed Euler's to this one. So this is heavy disguise. So this one uh, is then uh, number eight, please. It's elementary with m equals two. So there's two logarithms now and you can't combine the two logarithms into a single logarithm. And then just a kind of vague remark in the classical literature, which is rather uh, copious and fascinating we never found any natural examples involving three logarithms uh, and i may make a later remark on this and then we'll see later exactly how the difficulties arise they were clarified and summarized in a short 1970 paper of robert rich so now we come to the main theme of the talk in 1981, in his PhD thesis, James Davenport. Uh, so now the picture which I thought, there's a picture um, of sheep, the sheep photograph. Philip, can you find that? That's it. Here is, here is the man, James Davenport. Uh, he's being declared a freeman of the city of London. And he has to swear these oaths. He will be obedient to the mayor of London. Um, and uh, But he will warn the mayor if he finds out that there are plots against him. And there are other various things he had to pledge. And the fake sheep here um, uh, symbolise his right to drive sheep over London Bridge. So he has the theoretical right to dr drive real sheep over London Bridge. But he says on this is all on his website. He says that the Metropolitan Police of London take a very dim view of anybody trying to exercise this on their own initiative. 
So he has the theoretical right. And I think there's a there's a particular day where these people can all join and, and drive their sheep over. <clears throat> uh, and now the photograph, the other photograph, which you thought Philip was of Siegel. Yeah, this is not Siegel. This is his father, Harold Davenport. So <clears throat> this is because the com confusion can, can, can arise. Uh, uh, this is Harold Davenport, either either clapping or washing his hands. I don't quite know which, but it, whatever. Here is the ubiquitous cigarette. He was never without a cigarette. So that's how, Harold Davenport. And now uh, page nine, please. <clears throat> so asserted. This is uh, James Davenport who asserted that if you take now fxt with a parameter in, and uh, it's an algebraic function of x and t. So I'm sticking now to algebraic functions. And uh, this means that f is in the algebraic closure of c adjoint x and t, such that the integral fx t dx is not elementary identically in t. Then there are at most finitely many complex numbers tau, such that the specialized integral, when you specialize the t from the tau, is itself elementary. And uh, identically in T can be explained by an example. Uh, it, the integral of 1 over x plus t is log x plus t. So that's elementary. And then here you can simply sub, uh, specialize t to tau and you get elementary there. So when you have this identically in T business, then um, the thing become stays elementary under all tails, except perhaps for a finite number. So as long as this doesn't hold, then uh, you get this finiteness. Um, this is a rather bold assertion and, and somewhat original. Uh, uh, if you take uh, the classical specialization theorem of number theory, Hilbert's irreducibility theorem, then this doesn't hold in such a strong form. Uh, so x squared minus t is irreducible. But if you put t equals n squared, then x squared minus n squared is not. So uh, you don't have finiteness in this case. But he asserted that you have finiteness in this case, in our elementary intergroupability case. <clears throat> uh, page 10, please. <clears throat> but uh, in fact, uh, it was too good to be true. and. Uh, on the 9th of February 2016, I think it was about uh, quarter past three in the afternoon, after about three years' work, Umberto Zanier and I found two counterexamples. Uh, the first was uh, this one. So we take, again, the old dx over y, and we put another rational function in, which is slightly more complicated now of degree two. And this is not identically elementary. Uh, not quite e so easy to see it, but uh, it becomes elementary at t equals tau if and only if this point that we've seen before is torsion of order at least three on the curve, on this curve. Uh, that that looks like this formula torsion, uh, but that has only uh, only if. So here is if and only if, and here we can go backwards. And... Uh, this point is torsion for infinitely many. <clears throat> this gives infinitely many uh, tails. You can just choose your order as you like. And so you get uh, infinitely many uh, tails. And so this is a counterexample to uh, his assertion. And uh, if you think about it, this, this has some sort of strange uh, flavor. If we take order 1979, uh, which we happen to know is prime, then the integral becomes, uh, <clears throat> uh, it has m equals 2. It's a linear form with logarithms. It's a c1 log f1 plus a c2 log f2, as in Newville. But f1, f2, uh, they're now in the function field of the elliptic curve, cxy. They must have degrees in x, at least 989. Uh, whereas the original thing had degree only 2. So if you take an arithmetically complicated uh, tau, 
then uh, the integral gets uh, geometrically complicated. Uh, number number 11, please. Uh, so arithmetic complexity implies geometric complexity in some sense. Uh, this may remind people of Abelli's theorem where you have a similar kind of uh, odd, odd behavior. So this, uh, this counter example is not one of the new integrals of the title. This is an old new integral. Uh, this elliptic curve uh, has complex multiplication <clears throat> in this uh, quadratic field, Q root minus one. And for example, the action of minus one on X, Y is a minus X times minus X and then root minus one Y. Uh, we had a, the second counter example and that had a similar phenomenon in Q root minus three. Uh, as is well known, these are the only imaginary quadratic fields with non-trivial units. And it seemed to me that our proofs used these units. <clears throat> Uh, footnote here, we already knew that every elliptic counterexample must involve complex multiplication. But so, but uh, <clears throat> in this in our paper of 2020, we only had uh, root minus one and root minus three. Uh, page uh, 12, please. <clears throat> and in our paper, we uh, we had to we had to restrict to algebraic coefficients. Uh, I said that uh, f was uh, algebraic over c x t. Here we have to have uh, algebraic coefficients in, uh, and then we showed that such counterexamples are, are are very rare, and they were rather difficult to find. So we called them elusive. Uh, that was about the time that the Higgs boson was found, and <clears throat> also elusive. But there was a puzzle, and it's mentioned in our paper. Uh, some 10 years ago, 10, 10 years be previously, Daniel Vetron found counterexamples to a different conjecture, and these were in every Q root minus D. These are known as ribbit curves. Why do our elusives seem to stop at root minus three? And uh, what about root minus two in the middle? <clears throat> uh, finally, relatively recently 2021 we could after all construct elusives with respect to every q root minus d and uh i just will now um i didn't write them down they're not so difficult to write down uh but uh the method is analytic so we're back to uh whittaker and watson and biostrass so take your square root q take your d a positive integer and then you have the this field and there's an elliptic curve certainly with this complex multiplication we can put it in Weierstrass form with g2 and g3 and then you can always do this with algebraic g2 and g3 <clears throat> there are page 13 please associated Weierstrass functions pz which we saw already and also zeta z then you pick any delta zero, non-zero in the endomorphism ring. Uh, there is a functional equation involving values of the zeta function. Uh, zeta of delta z is uh, delta bar times zeta of z. Delta bar is the complex conjugate, plus a couple of other terms. One is a linear term, alpha z, and the other one is essentially an elliptic function, uh, and it's an odd elliptic function. So uh, it's the derivative of the p function times a polynomial in the p function. Uh, this alpha then depends on delta, and it's also algebraic. And uh, q also depends on delta. It's a rational function of this new variable x, formerly known as Twitter, and it also has uh, algebraic coefficients. This functional equation looks completely classical, and uh, I still don't know, uh, still don't know how to find it in the classical literature. As, all, as far as I know, it seems to be written down only around 1975, independently by Dale Brownwell with Ken Kubota, and by me. That was in my 
PhD thesis with a misprint. Now, if you differentiate this and then use the uh, zeta dashed is minus p, then you get another functional equation, this time involving just p. And it looks much nicer because uh, this differentiates to alpha. Uh, and uh, you just you, you get simply uh, p of delta z is r of pz, where r depends on delta as well. And is a, so this rational function. Now we're nearly at the different, nearly at the counter examples. Um, they come in page uh, 14. Now take delta not in Z. So a real, a real complex multiplication. But first we had a differential, we called it the usual suspect because uh, it was always, it was, it was somehow the obvious one to be uh, to have this property uh, so it's omega now I talk about differentials I don't use integral signs anymore omega usual suspect is omega usual suspect depending on e and also the delta and you have the usual dx over y and then you have these these terms here this is also a rational function of x a simple rational function of x but uh, involves these uh, rational functions of t as well r dash t over x minus rt minus delta delta bar over x minus t. <clears throat> and if you take uh, uh, the situation of the first two elusives, then it really does more or less lead to what we found. For a while, we thought it works for root minus two. And if you work this out for root minus two, it's uh, this thing. Uh, 5t squared plus 40t plus 62 times x plus t cubed plus 8t squared plus 70t plus 144 over x minus t and then times uh, 2t plus 8 times x plus t squared plus 4t plus 18 and the y has changed now this is the this is a convenient form of elliptic curve with complex multiplication by square root of minus two. So we have uh, coefficients 30 and 56. But this is definitely not elusive. And uh, if you put t equals tau, it almost never becomes elementary. I think it becomes elementary at just three values, which are easy to describe. But it's uh, it doesn't give you infinitely many values of tau. So that doesn't work. And the and the final step was to make a final adjustment. Omega is the uh, usual suspect minus a multiple, a constant multiple of dx over y. Uh, this is a constant. This is a constant uh, with regard to x. It just involves the t. And the q is the um, rational function in the func Now I would flip back, but I can't. Q is the rational function in the functional equation there. Thank you. This is this Q here. Thank you. Uh, 14. Oh, is that, yes, I'm, R is R is also as in the previous one. So you have these two related rational functions, R and Q. So we make this function equation, then we get an elusive. Uh, page uh, 15, please. We omit the proof. Uh, a footnote in Whittaker and Watson, section 2053, plays a minor but non-trivial role. So, uh, as luck would have it, the uh, the modification to the uh, to the thing on the previous slide, which turned out not to be elusive, is just to add one to the rational function, and then after some simplification, you get this, which looks a bit shorter. Than what I wrote down on the previous page, but the degree in x has gone up to 2. x squared plus 2t plus 10x plus 2t plus 18 over x, same denominator, x minus t, 2t plus x, 2t plus x, 2t plus 8x plus t squared plus 4t plus 18 dx over y. We could then show it's the simplest one and essentially unique. It, there's no unique one because you can. In fact, you can always replace t by any other rational function of t. Uh, 
And this this is uh, essentially the simpler one, simplest one. Um, and in view of the enormous amount of time required to find this, we called it super elusive. As a corollary, all elliptic elusives can be written down now, and they all have two logarithms. Uh, then I raise this problem of three logarithms, and it's still conceivable that you can find somewhere three logarithms for something sporadic, which doesn't come from a specialization of a family. But this is a somewhat vague uh, assertion. Now, just for safety, um, these calculations were very tedious, involving sign, endless sign problems, which is why I, why I like to work in characteristic two, where it doesn't the signs don't matter. But here they matter a lot. And uh, we calculated the above integral at this value of tau, so two plus three root six, and that corresponds to a point of order three. Uh, it is m equals two, so it's c1 log f1 plus c2 log f2, where, page 16, uh, C1, there we are, they're, they're written down. Uh, I've taken some trouble always to read out formula to slow the expedition down, but I'm not going to read these out. Uh, you can see that uh, here, you can see that the C1 and C2, their ratio is this root minus two, so it's irrational. And that means you can't combine the two logarithms. Uh, how does one actually do this integration? Maple, as I said, is is out of depth with much simpler things. And and uh, here you your this looks like a, a number field of, of, of degree eight here with i in it and square root of two and square root of three. Not to mention this square root of a square root here. So it's a field degree eighty or eight or sixteen, and it's just out of can't handle these things. At least I don't know how to make it. Uh, there's a there's a there's a computational machinery called Fricas, and that can actually do it. Um, but Fricas is not guaranteed to turn up an answer. Uh, one the, well, again, one looks at the poles of the differential uh, with t equals tau. Um, they're simple, and uh, if you remember, the denominator is could we have 15, 15 back? Yes, yeah, the dominant dominant <clears throat> denominator gives you the poles here, and so x equals tau is is gives you one actually two to uh, one pair of poles. And this other value of x gives you a, a rational function of t. And they're written down in the uh, sheet uh, 16. And now 17, I think, is, is needed. That's 16, that's tau, pi 1. And now sheet 17 is pi 2, and that's this, uh, this abscissa here. And in fact, pi 2 is square root of 2 times pi 1. And then you can find logarithmic differentials, df1 over f1, df2 over f2, with the same poles. If, if you have this, uh, if you take tau suitably to correspond to a torsion point, that would be pi1 is a torsion point, and therefore pi2 is automatically a torsion point. We then find c1, c2, such that this linear combination has the same residues. So now you've got the same poles and the same residues. All the poles are simple. And so if you take the difference between the uh, original differential and this linear combination, you've got no poles at all. Now, the only differentials with no poles are constant multiples of dx over y, a constant re with respect to x. And uh, one just works out c to 100 decimal places if, if one's desperate and the one gets c equals zero. This c is related to this final adjustment coefficient to delta qt uh, in the differential, but we it's zero here because we kind of took it over to the other side and made it zero. We calculated some other super elusives and we went up to q root minus 163 for fun. 
This is the last one where you can stay over the rationals because of class number one. Uh, now the degree in, two, in T has gone up to 162. Uh, the degree in X is still two. And some of the coefficients have 535 digits. I could show it on the on my screen here. Well, I can't, in fact, uh, but I have it on Maple, but it takes about half an hour to scroll through. <clears throat> so uh, page 18, please. Uh, and now I will change theme a little bit uh, and uh, I can the link between the two themes is the Weierstrass sigma function sigma dashed over sigma is zeta and, and there is a functional equation for this as well of the same sort sigma delta z here is sigma delta z and here is sigma z and this is to a power delta delta bar that we've seen before and the whole thing is squared and then uh, you have this uh, exponential polynomial where alpha is as before, and p is as before. No, and, and p now is uh, also depends on delta, but is a polynomial. So you've got gone from rational functions to polynomials, and uh, this is this is rather handy for calculations. Um, if you differentiate logarithmically this one, you get the functional equation for zeta, which then differentiated gives the functional equation for p. So it's kind of a hierarchy of things. And this, this one for sigma is somehow the fundamental one. And it also supplies an indirect connection between the elusive integrals and the rebit curves. So I have no clue how much time I have now. Uh, could someone give me an estimate? Um, about 10 minutes, you can go because you started later. So it's it's up to you. Okay, I'll have to I'll have to stop. Let me see. I'll, I'll go ahead with this. Uh, this. Uh, this. Uh, I really wanted to talk about the these rebate curves, and the connection is is Madeline Mumford, uh, the, uh, the well known in Diophantine geometry circles, about torsion points. Uh, the simplest case here is to solve completely x one plus x two equals one in roots of unity. Here it can be done with a simple picture. Page 19, please, does not contain the simple picture. Uh, after that, one can treat a general algebraic curve in GM cross GM with the multiplicative group GM of non-zero complex numbers. So you've got a general algebraic curve replacing this line. After that, one can work with a general inside a general commutative algebraic group G. So this would be this G, but then you can have now an abelian variety. <clears throat> but uh, just as in the Davenport assertion, one must allow a parameter. And this puts you in the so-called relative Manning-Mumford situation. And uh, our own work in 2020 involved mostly abelian varieties then parameterized by a single parameter but we also had to contend with so-called additive extensions of elliptic curves g and these sit inside an exact sequence or an elliptic curve e here and uh, g a is now a long hand for the comp for the additive group of complex numbers and uh, now you allow parameters um, you can't allow parameters in there because see involves no parameters, but you could allow parameters in E and uh, in most of the work, it's the, uh, this is, this is Legendre. It's the Legendre curve page 20, please. Defined by Y squared equals X, X minus one, X minus T, for example. So that was the situation for elusives as regards torsion. By contrast, the Ribet curves sit in multiplicative extensions g uh, and now it looks much the same you have g and you have uh, an elliptic curve and you have gm here so that's that's now multiplicative so i put a one instead of a zero so it doesn't look like a big change uh, in fact now the theory also forces complex multiplication on you 
which forces E to be constant. Say again, let's put it in Weierstrass form, as we did before. And uh, and then we have uh, our G. Uh, now the parameter seems to have vanished again. Again, there's no parameter in, in, in C star. And now there's no parameter in E because it's constant. So where's the parameter gone? Uh, and here it comes in a more subtle form. Uh, these multiplicative extensions are far from unique uh, and they're parametrized. They come in families, whereas the additive extensions are, the additive extensions have much more rigidity and they're practically unique. They are, they're hundred percent unique in, 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 the, in current number theory terminology and they're all isomorphic to each other. Here, the isomorphism classes are parametrized themselves and they're parametrized not by a simple T, but by points pi on E itself. It's not clear how to see this. Um, one can imagine, one can see it through the exponential maps of the, of the algebraic groups. The exponential map on uh, GM is, is, is the exponential map, uh, E to the W from C to GM. But on G, in here, this G, now that's get that's two dimension, two dimensional. So you'll have functions in C two of Z and W, and the key functions are page twenty one, x equals p z, and then also you have p dash z, but that's uh, that's uh, that's kind of somehow superfluous. The other critical uh, parameter is uh, u. And this is given by sigma of little z plus big z over sigma of little z, sigma big z times e to the w. So that's the e to the w that we saw before with this little modification. And <clears throat> so we have uh, little z and w, and we also have a big z floating around. The big z is more or less pi. So if you write pi, parameterize pi, Analytically, it's p z p dash p dash big z p big z p dash big z. So with these two uh, algebraic coordinates, we can sort of see g in C two, some kind of projection on it, but good enough for practical purposes. And if we throw in t equals p z into here, then we get a much better view, and that's in C three. And now you've got the parameterization into account. Even though you've still only got a group, an algebraic group in C2, you've got an object in C3 whose fibers are the various um, various genes. And uh, now you have uh, algebraic coordinates x, u, and t. And now in this C3, we would like to construct the Rebet curve. Uh, we pick delta now in the endomorphism ring even more special so it's purely imaginary delta bar is minus delta then we choose in this star thing make a strange choice of big z and w in terms of little z and the big z is delta times z and w is z times zeta delta z minus a half alpha and then i keep the dependence on delta here times z squared so uh <clears throat> There's only one analytic independent analytic variable left. That's little z. So you're going to get a curve of z variables, various, but it looks it looks like a horrible analytic curve because this is horrible analytic. This is even the sort of essential singularity stuff up here. Uh, but in fact, it's an algebraic curve. So we can see this with a little bit of calculation. Now we can see one relation between these three. Uh, coordinates uh, at, 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 at once. T is P Z and big Z and P big Z is P delta Z from here. And here we have the functional equation. That's R delta of P Z and that's R delta of X. So T is a rational function of X. And so we have one, at least one algebraic relation between these two to three coordinates. Uh, page uh, 22, please. So an algebraic relation. Now, what about U? U now becomes, uh, so big Z was here, but now it's delta little Z. 
And then we had some exponential parts and they simplify to, to this. And uh, here you see sigma delta Z. So this suggests the functional equations for sigma. Here you see sigma of one plus delta Z. And so you're going to need uh, the functional equation with delta plus one as well. And they involve squaring. So you're going to have to square the whole thing. And then uh, miraculously, the exponential part goes away. And you get u squared is p delta plus one x over p delta x. And p was a polynomial. So this is a second algebraic relation, definitely different. And that gives you your curve. Uh, and uh, I think here this slide is the first appearance of the of of ribbit curves in print, at least in this kind of uh, two dimensional form. If the delta is minus root minus one, it's the boring u squared is minus two root minus one x. But for delta it was minus two, the the uh, source of all that, all that troubles. It's this longer thing, two u squared x plus four is one minus two minus root minus two x squared plus four plus 10 root minus two x plus 14 plus x root two. For delta equals root minus 163, it is, page 23, about time to stop. Uh, so do I have, um, um, let me see, do I have, say, three minutes? Yes, yes, please take, please take the time. Uh, am, am I, I don't want to go over. No, no, please, please go ahead, David, please. Uh, just perhaps one more slide. Um, uh, it reminds me of a story about uh, uh, that someone was in the next hotel room to the famous cellist Rostropovich, and they could hear him practicing a piece, but they knew it wasn't the piece for tomorrow's concert, and so they were puzzled. And when they got to the concert, they found that he was actually practicing his encores. So uh, here are my encores, which I've practiced and written down. And uh, this is just open problems. Um, so uh, complex coefficients to algebraic coefficients. Uh, there's no work on this at the moment, uh, but uh, it's not expected that you get any new elusive things. And uh, then uh, <clears throat> even over here, this uh, doesn't uh, this doesn't automatically point to elliptic. You have to allow curves C, say, of, of higher genus. We've been dealing with genus one. A genus zero is easy. There are no elusives. Um, already we had seen in our paper that if, if there is an elusive on C, then the Jacobian must contain an elliptic curve with complex modification. And this more recent work enables us to reverse this implication. In other words, there's an elusive on C if and only if the Jacobian contains an elliptic curve on complex modification. Okay, I think I'll stop here.